Welcome to the Carnivore Cast, the podcast focused on the carnivore diet and lifestyle, with practical advice from successful carnivores, citizen scientists, and top researchers. I'm your host, Scott Meslinski, and I'm here to speak with experts and experienced carnivores to get answers to your biggest and meatiest questions while helping you live your best life as a carnivore. If you enjoy the show, please consider supporting the Carnivore Cast on Patreon. By becoming a patron, you'll help us reach more people and continue to create content on Carnivore. There are also exclusive perks available, such as private Q&As, consultations with me, and more. Become a supporter at patreon.com slash carnivorecast. Check the episode description for the link. Thank you, and I'll see you there. Robin Switzer is the organizer and brains behind the amazing KetoCon conference. She's also the COO of Keto Vangelis and has used a keto diet, then carnivore diet, to help fix her insulin resistance, overcome disordered eating and addiction, lose weight, and manage PCOS. Welcome to the show, Robin. Good morning. Thank you. Happy to be here. Yeah, so excited to have you on. Um, and maybe let's start with KetoCon and then we can move on to you. Um, okay. So what is KetoCon for those who don't know about it and how is it different than other keto conferences or events? Well, uh, KetoCon is, we're actually going into our fourth year, but KetoCon really is the uh, result of kind of a vision to put together a place where people who are new to keto or people who are following this lifestyle and feel isolated, it was really a way for us to start forming a community. And so when we, when we first ventured into this, we really had no idea if, if the community would form and if people would, would want to come to an event like this. And so in year one, we we had maybe I think we had about 545 people there, maybe 550 people there and 30 exhibitors. And then we were so excited that to to have this group together that we decided to do it again. And the following year, we just about doubled. Then last year, which was our third year, we were up to 3,500 people. We had 120 exhibitors. So the whole thing just kind of blossomed into exactly what we wanted it to. So KetoCon now is a place where people who meet online or who meet, um, you know, in different Facebook groups and so forth, people come in to meet their online friends. They come in for three days of learning for three days of seeing what the latest products are and, you know, coming out in the space and the keto space and just have fun. So we it, we call it a conference. It's KetoCon, the science and the science and stories of keto, but it has become very much uh, a social event as opposed to a conference where people sit in one place all day long. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. And I think it's just a testament to the great work that you and Brian are doing that has been able to grow so effectively and people respond to such a such a positive event that's really changing their lives and something they can look forward to every year. Um, yeah, it's life changing for all of us. It's life changing for the, the, our team that, that puts this on every year. It's just it touches everybody who's involved in it. That's awesome. And can you talk about, um, you mentioned community and I think that's Mm -hmm. something that's largely overlooked and conferences are an amazing way to foster that. Part of why I started this podcast was to try to connect with people, you know, carnivores, other keto, uh, dieters like myself. It's very Mm -hmm. easy to feel isolated, um, with this type of eating and, and it means so much to be able to both virtually and especially in person. Um, connect with people in that way. Can you talk about why community community is critical to any dietary change and why you've focused on that aspect with KetoCon? Sure. Uh, you know, I, I've been I've been in this space since 2008, and at that time, it's it felt very isolating. Uh, I knew I what I needed to do for my own health and welfare, but. Um, anytime I was around friends or family, I was always the odd man out. And if you ordered, you know, something without a bun, people thought you were nuts. Yeah. And, uh, and it kind of, I think that 
that social pressure kind of uh, has an impact on your ability to stay strong and stick to what you feel is best for you. Because then you, if everybody around you is doing something different, it, I think it's very easy to question your your beliefs, especially when you when you're just always the odd man out. So uh, I, I think all of us coming into this space, I think it's pretty common for people to have uh, had they're coming into this space because they've had health or or just weight issues and they've tried a bunch of other things and they all know that feeling of being the odd man out. So I think specifically people in this space appreciate a sense of community. And just like uh, like what you're doing with your podcast, it it's kind of like a way for people to build on their confidence level and their foundation that what they're doing is best for them in a world where they get a lot of pushback. Mm, yeah, definitely. That's a great point. Um, and the, those challenges can really be big barriers to people making these types of lifestyle changes. Absolutely. Uh, can you talk about, Robin, what's going to be new about KetoCon uh, next year in, in 2020? Sure, sure. Well, we're already tracking to be larger than last year from a ticket sales perspective. We wow. launched early bird tickets last year in August for 30 days. And this year we launched... Um, in the middle of it's the end of September, so we min, we launched in the middle of August, and we allowed for six weeks this time instead of four, and uh, the growth is just astounding. So this year I'm going to have to cap ticket sales because the the space will uh, I don't think it will comfortably accommodate more than four thousand people. So we are going to cap ticket sales this year at four thousand. So that will be different <laughs> going from 500 people to 4,000 people, huge growth. For yeah. Us. Wow. We'll have uh, more exhibitors this year. So we'll have 138 exhibitors this year and 45 speakers, which is an increase from last year. So we've changed the schedule a little bit to allow for more speakers. Every year we do a, uh, on each day we do a, a panel discussion at the end of the day. So we do a fitness panel, a medical panel, and a stories panel. And we're adding additional panels this year, which we'll likely do in the breakout rooms. So we'll do uh, one of our business lines is Keto Evangelist Coaching. We have a, a group of coaches that coach people individually and in groups, people who are new to keto or need help, people who need help, excuse me, just um, – nailing down what works for them. So we're going to do an Ask the Coaches panel uh, with the um, Kid Evangelist coaches. And we have some other surprises in store that you will be involved in, and I don't want to give Ooh. that away. <laughs> but I'm super excited about that because, um, you know, there's the trend towards carnivora is, is very big and popular. And I think you being involved in the event and uh, what will we can probably announce later after we have our plans finalized. I think that that will be an exciting addition to KetoCon as well. Yeah, for sure. I'm in incredibly excited for the event. I was very <laughs> sorry to miss it last year, but had a wedding. So yeah, my yeah. own. Totally um, on a strong wedding, which yeah. is much more important. We yeah. also have um, every year we do an entrepreneur mastermind session very early on Saturday morning. And we are going to do that again this year. We, uh, because of space limitations, we can only allow for 300 people. So it it's good and it's bad because we can only allow for 300 people and more than that want to get in. But it's on the flip side, it's positive for people who are able to get tickets to it because the panel is um, speakers who have, who have succeeded in this space as small business owners. So they're, they are in the entrepreneur space, in the keto space. And typically the format is they each introduce themselves. Last year we had seven panel members. I think we'll probably keep it seven, maybe, maybe up to 10, but that will be the, the most. And they talk about themselves, what they've done, their products, what their future goals are for growth and so forth. And then we open it up to the audience. And then the audience gets to ask their specific questions about their business, what they're doing, what their challenges are, or people who are looking to start a new business 
they have an opportunity to connect with these uh, thought leaders, successful business owners, and ask for guidance. So this is uh, one of probably one of the most popular things we've done as part of KetoCon because it just keeps on growing. And it's so exciting to be part of part of a, an intimate discussion, if you can call it intimate with 300 people, yeah. uh, with, with thought leaders like this, the successful business owners who have proven that this is doable. Yeah. That sounds like really the ultimate resource for entrepreneurs in this space. Um, yeah. sounds like we, an amazing way to be inspired, make connections, learn. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And we only, we only, uh, open it to people who are attending KetoCon. So, um, that way the benefit of, of being at something like this is limited to the people who, who are coming in and committed to spending the three days at KetoCon and investing in themselves and, and this lifestyle. Mm. The other, uh, the other thing I'm working on, which I'm also not ready to give out the details for we're working on a Saturday evening after party. So, uh, one of the things that I've thought is so uh, exciting about KetoCon is that so many other little events happen during that, during the weekend. Yeah. Companies come into town and host small, smaller parties. Um, they do like last year, Goody Beats did a meetup in, um, I think San Marcos or San Antonio. I can't remember which, where he did it, but I wasn't able to go because we were, it was set up day for the event. But so all of these other little events take place over the course of the three or four days. And so we're going to do a Saturday evening after party, uh, which should be, uh, if I do it well, <laughs> a lot of fun. So that will be I'm sure you will. <laughs> I'm going to try. And we also are going to be doing cooking demos again this year. So the way that the, the, uh, schedule works is that we open up early in the morning and we start with speakers on the keynote stage and in the breakout rooms upstairs, we break for lunch and then we come back until about two 30. Uh, that's when we do the, um, panels in the afternoons on the keynote stage. And then we, then we close down and it's dedicated exhibitor hall hours during those hours each day. Uh, we will be doing cooking demos. So we're bringing in some, people who are very popular in this space to do cooking demos on the main stage. And we'll also be doing cooking demos each day in the Keto Evangelist booth because one of our other business lines is the Keto Evangelist kitchen. So um, Mandy Pagano is our uh, star, if you will. So she's the recipe creator and she's going to be doing demos in our booth each day as well in the afternoons. So I, I think that, what did I leave off? Oh, we are going to also this year, again, I'm finalizing the details. We will be doing uh, functional movements, body weight classes each day. So I'm bringing in someone who's local to the area who, who specializes in this. And we'll be doing classes each day for uh, body movement exercise classes. So my goal is to have so many things going on that people don't know what to do. <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah. um, uh, I think that people will be torn. I'll probably get some complaints that someone couldn't see a speaker because they were at a body weight class instead or vice versa. So, but that's the whole point is to just have so much activity that 4,000 people that come into town are entertained or busy or learning um, socializing and networking from the minute they get there until the minute we shut down. I can't wait. It sounds like an absolute <laughs> mastermind um, that you have going on behind the scenes, Robin, and I'm super excited for it. Yeah, me too. And I don't, I don't want to give the impression that I do this by myself. So I, I do have a team that works with me. Um, I have Ryan Geffon, who is our sales manager. He works with all of the exhibitors. I have Katie Diaz who handles our social media. I have Rekha J who do- does all of our web development. So she's, she's the one who built that beautiful KetoCon website, our new website. Mm. And we'll be working on additional websites as we continue to grow the company. And we have the coaching division that helps us promote KetoCon. We have Mandy in the kitchen. So I- I'm not alone in this, uh, but it, we are considering what we pull off in a year. It, we are a very small team. Yeah, it's very impressive. 
Um, and that's quite modest of you. Uh, shifting gears a little bit, Robin, what, sure. let's talk about what got you first interested in keto personally. Uh, well, uh, it was really just, um, <laughs> probably an act of desperation. So, um, I had probably from my early twenties on, and I, I'm only saying in my early twenties because that's what I remember it probably started much sooner. Um, just had, uh, hormonal imbalance issues and, um, I had PCOS. Um, I had like horrendous hormonal highs and lows, thyroid issues. And I suffered from uh, what I would call food obsession. And that also fed into a lot of uh, depression. And as I got older, anxiety as well. So the only way to manage any of that um was through food. So I wasn't willing to be medicated. And uh, honestly, at, in my early 20s, I didn't really, I didn't really fully understand that it was so closely related to food. Um, I knew I had issues with weight. And my whole focus was on that. Um, so I found low carb as a result of trying to address the weight. And then over the years realized that it was solving a lot of the issue, the other issues that I was having. And it, I really started with low carb. And at the time it was low carb and low fat. And I lost quite a bit of weight doing that. Uh, and then I found keto, which brought me to a place where I felt mentally and emotionally better because of the higher fat content that I was taking in. But uh, over the course of time, the keto treats and my and my obsession with just food as entertainment or food as a coping mechanism kind of creeped back in and um that's when i decided i was going to have to really make some serious dietary changes i knew that it was all related to food it was pretty easy to tell when i ate something the impact on my emotional state and my physical state so uh luckily I mean, this this took place over the course of 10 years. So I used to think I was a fast learner, but clearly looking back, it, <laughs> I wasn't putting the puzzle pieces together very well. But in January of this year, um, I met Nicole, who you interviewed recently, Healthy with Nicole, and um, we started talking about carnivore. And I had seen carnivore and the talk about carnivore in this community for a while, but I really thought it was ridiculously crazy. Uh, <laughs> And, but after talking to Nicole, I was like, well, she certainly has been successful in addressing her health issues with this. And, um, my, what is my other, I don't ha really have any other options. So I kind of ventured into this with the thought that I would do it for 90 days and see what happened. That was after, that was yeah January of this year within those 90 days, like there was a huge turnaround for me physically, um, emotionally, and the simplicity of uh, an elimination protocol. And just it, uh, what happened to me was the mental part of it was bigger than the physical part. So doing this took away my options. So I mentally accepted this is what I do yeah. and started focusing on other things. And uh, I, I really have no intention of going back. Recently, someone asked me, you know, if you felt if I felt that this was a temporary solution and that I would eventually go back to incorporating more foods into my diet. And if I felt that I had healed the issues that I had and I have. So, I mean. I've shared with you in private conversations, I'm 57 and can typically run circles around people half my age. I'm not suffering the physical um, symptoms that other women who are going through this life phase uh, experience. And I yeah. think it's totally related to my diet. So I, who knows, I, I, I guess I can't, 
I'll never say never, but I have no intentions of changing anything. My diet is very simple. I don't spend any of any amount of time in the kitchen really anymore. I, I don't spend a ton of time at the grocery store anymore. <laughs> so my whole life has just been simplified and it's opened up so much time for me, both emotionally and on the calendar to focus on other things. Yeah, it's amazing. That's, I, I think that's a great way to put it and remarkable, um, the progress you've made with carnivore, even switching from a ketogenic diet. And, um, I know you, you have, uh, a husband and kids. Does your family mm-hmm. eat this way as well? Um, well, both of my sons are really healthy eaters. My son Ryan, um, does follow low carb most of the time carnivore diet. My older son, Sam, uh, follows a pretty much keto diet. Um, they're both very healthy and neither of them have experienced the issues that I have. So luckily, um, at a younger age, because they're both, my older son is 33. My younger son is getting ready. Ryan is getting ready to turn 30. Uh, they're both doing really well. Their diets are really clean and really proud of them for I think people your age are recognizing the connection between health and lifestyle and, and their longevity and feeling well now. So luckily for them, they're going to have 30 years of health without struggling to find what works. So they do follow it. That was a long way around your question. <laughs> and my husband is um, five years older than I am and extremely fit. He's never had a weight problem as wow. an adult. Um, and he's followed my lead with being very low carb. He does, I I have convinced him to add more fat. He's not carnivore by any means, but his diet is very clean. Uh, and he doesn't have any health issues. So he's 62 and he runs circles around me. So (laughs) yeah. And he looks like he's 50 at least. So yeah, he's, he's very healthy as well. That's fantastic. You guys sound like the Incredibles family. (laughs) And, um, I, I love, it just makes me think of something in your Instagram profile, Robin, which is you say, just eat real food. Um, why do you say that? Because it really is that simple. Yeah. So, uh, it, that may sound like a, a bit of a conflict between what we do at KetoCon and my life. Um, I really think that there is, I think that Coming into this lifestyle, going from like a standard American diet to carnivore would be really, really difficult. Yeah. But if you go from a standard American diet and learning yourself and being willing to allow for the transition from standard American diet to low carb to understanding that there's a component with the higher fat with keto that you will feel much better mentally and physically and transitioning from all of that to a very simple just eat real food protocol. Uh, I think I I personally think that people need to allow themselves the time to do that. And when you're coming at, when you're coming into this from, from a wellness perspective, improving health conditions, I think that you have more patience than someone who's tried every diet on the planet and uh, wants to lose weight fast and wants to find the one thing that's going to work. I, I don't see those people having as much, much patience, but if you follow this path in the way that I've just described, you naturally fall into a place where you're just eating real food. Yeah. And maybe occasionally you can have something that is considered a keto product or treat. Um, those, a lot of those products are not something that is optimal for everyday life, but it's cert- they certainly are, have a place in a transitional lifestyle. The other thing is that not everybody needs to or wants to have their diet this clean. Uh, There's a lot of people out there who don't have the metabolic or hormonal history that someone like me has, and they are perfectly fine eating clean during the week and having whatever keto treat they want or whatever on the weekend. I would still say overall, stay away from grains of any of any form stay away from sugar in any form and eat real food 
cut out the inflammatory oils, which is going to get rid of the majority of the bad foods that are packaged anyway. Yeah, that's fantastic advice. The other thing I would say is be wary of anything that has the keto name on it. Read ingredients because this is becoming a really popular space and there's a lot of companies jumping in to try and make a dollar on the popularity. They won't last forever, but I mean, you're seeing it with big names, big brands putting keto on their products. Just read ingredients. And then to me, focusing on just eating real food, eliminating all of the, the garbage, just your lifestyle improves so much that you actually you don't feel that you are being deprived or you're eliminating things. You just this is just what you do. It becomes your lifestyle. Yeah. I, I love that advice. And I think you make an excellent point that most people got sick eating vegetable oils and sugar and processed foods. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, we can, it can quickly turn into minutia and, um, overwhelm people if mm-hmm. you are too specific with what people have to eat. Um, right. that's why I never say, if, you know, if something's working for you, there's no, no need to go carnivore. It's not like superior to keto or anything. If you're right. feeling good on keto and you're not having issues, it's fine if you want to do that. If you want to try a carnivore, that's great too. But um, mm-hmm. there should be no nutritional superiority. Yeah. And you know, one of the other things that I really love about carnivore is that I really, I don't have to think about how much I'm eating. So coming from a, uh, a, a history of like depriving myself and counting calories and counting carbs and all that stuff, uh, always uh, looking at portion sizes and not over feeling, always feeling like I couldn't be full. Um, the mental and physical um, feeling of satiety and not worrying about what it takes to feel that way and then being able to push the plate away and then I'm done and walk away and not think about food anymore. That's kind of like a freedom that uh, I never experienced in any other protocol. Yeah, it's kind of the the meat zen that people talk about. I've definitely experienced that too. Yeah, yeah. And just because I I know this is kind of antithetical to everything we've just said, but I'm sure folks will wonder sort of what carnivore looks like for you. Can you kind of describe a day of eating for yourself? You know, do you fast? How many meals? Do Do you incorporate organs, supplements, salt, Mm -hmm. coffee, things like that? (laughs) Yes, all of the above. So uh, yeah, I typically fast until noon or so depending on uh, how late I ate the day before. Um, so I try, to, I try to keep my eating window at four hours, regardless of what time I start. Sometimes I fast longer, sometimes shorter, but I keep my eating, eating window at four hours. And my diet is really, really simple. Um, I eat red meat. I eat very small amounts of chicken because I don't find it as satisfying as you stated recently. Yeah. Um, I do eat seafood. I like seafood and I eat eggs, pastured eggs. Um, I don't add fat to any of my foods. Uh, I cook my meat in an air fryer. So whatever fat is in the meat is the fat that I eat. Nice. Uh, I do, I do eat, um, organ meats there. I find that the only place I feel comfortable getting them for, I don't feel comfortable getting them from the grocery store. So the only place I feel comfortable getting them is online. So uh, I do order them and then make like pâtés or I mix them with ground beef and make liver and ground beef meatballs, that kind of thing. I recently purchased the um, ancestral supplements, um, excuse me, or organ supplement, the beef organ supplement because I'm not eating it as often as um, I was probably eating it once a week, maybe once every other week. And so to avoid having to cook it (laughs) and buy it, um, I bought these supplements to see how I felt taking those. So I've only been taking them for about a week. Uh, And salt. Yeah, I salt my food heavily, but I don't add, I don't mean, I don't add salt to my water or anything like that. Um, and fasting I do every day. Yeah. I mean, it's, I'm pretty boring. Like I don't have <laughs> a magic potion or like some unusual, uh, protocol to share with people. I just, I keep it as simple as I possibly can. Yeah. I try never to eat after three o'clock. I 
in the afternoon. So my eating window is usually like 11 to 3 or 12 to 4, something like that. And I eat usually one very small meal and one large meal. So depending on the situation, I'll eat like when I when I start to get hungry, I'll eat a couple of hard boiled eggs and or cook some scrambled eggs. And then a few hours later, I'll eat my larger meal and then I'm done for the day. I order most of my meat online so I can get grass fed and grass finished meat. But um, I would say probably 75 percent of the time I eat that. The rest of the time I go to a local market and buy my meat there. That sounds like you you might call it boring, Robin, but I would call it refined. It sounds like you found found something that works very well for you. And like you said, it just frees up your mind to not have to think about it. Yeah, it really does. It's it's amazing to me because it's been an obsession of mine for such a long time to not have to to not have to think about it. I even remember one time saying to Nicole, you know, um, now that I'm not cooking all the time, now that I'm not thinking about food all the time, I don't know what to do with myself. Like I need a new hobby or something because <laughs> what I found is that I'm all I'm doing is just working more. That's I'm not great. doing anything like with that time. So that actually was a big transition for me to have all that time to not be obsessed with something. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's it's worked out for KetoCon and Keto Evangelist. <laughs> um and Robin, this has been really enjoyable for me. Um, you know, I always love talking to you and, and great that you get to share your story with, with the audience as well. Where can people find out more about you? Uh, the best way to find out what I'm up to is on Instagram because I don't go on Facebook very much anymore, but um, I'm the Robin Switzer on Instagram and um, they can find KetoCon at KetoCon on Instagram, on Facebook. Um, I'm there occasionally. It's Robin Switzer. Um, or they can direct message me or email me. <laughs> um, but probably the best place is on Instagram. Awesome. Well, thanks again for your time today, Robin. Really appreciate it and look forward to sharing this with folks. Thanks so much, Scott. Thank you. Appreciate to spend the time. Of course. If you enjoy the show, please consider supporting the Carnivore Cast on Patreon. By becoming a patron, you'll help us reach more people and continue to create content on Carnivore. There are also exclusive perks available, such as private Q&As, consultations with me, and more. Become a supporter at patreon.com slash carnivorecast. Check the episode description for the link. Thank you, and I'll see you there. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Carnivore Cast. If you enjoyed this episode, please review on iTunes. It really helps us out. And share it with a friend. What questions would you like answered or who would you like to hear from in the carnivore research community? You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at carnivorecast or go to carnivorecast.com. You can also email me at info at carnivorecast.com. I'd love to hear from you. Until next time, keep it carnivore.